Okay. There you go. All right. So, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the introduction. I thought I might briefly introduce myself because there's probably some people on the call that have not met me or haven't come across me. Um, so, yeah, Andrew Robertson, I have been ballooning for, I don't know, since I was four, so since the late 70s, um, but been a pilot and a competition pilot since sort of the early 90s. Um, the reason they dragged me out of bed to talk about technology is over the years I've been, I am a self-confessed nerd, so ever since GPSs, laptops or anything like that came along, I was playing around with them, had them in the basket since, I don't know, mid-90s. Um, but then most recently, I've been working on a project with the FAI, um, so the Ballooning Commission on the development of what's called the Balloon Live technology, as well as the website that's Watch Me Fly, which we're going to walk through today. <clears throat> Excuse me while my voice uh, wakes up. Um, I am acknowledging that we've got a lot of different sort of skill levels on the call from all around the world. So um, I'm going to kind of talk to this a bit from the sort of lowest common denominator in terms of we're going to go through some of the basics. But what I thought I'd do today is walk through a number of things. So firstly, I'll just give a bit of an overview of the history of technology and competitions. So over the years, it's changed quite a lot. And certainly over the years that I've been involved in ballooning, I've seen a lot of changes and been involved in a lot of those changes. So I thought I'd just sort of set the scene by showing you how we've got to where we are today with the amount of the technology. Um, then I'm gonna go through sort of what the whole balloon live and watch me fly thing is um, and the technology that we're using today in competitions. Um, and I'll also run through a brief demo. So I know a lot of people have seen how this technology works, but I thought I'd just run through a scenario of what it looks like on a typical competition day in terms of how we use the tech and then how the data from that tech is actually consumed by both the pilots and the officials and scoring team. And then I thought I'd run through briefly just what it sort of looks like in terms of the type of technology that you would need to have in the basket to start doing some more sort of serious sort of nationals level type competition, but then take you through the journey of what it looks like to have the extreme amount of gear in the basket and sort of show you what we're using these days and what a lot of pilots are using at a world championships. Feel free to uh, ask questions, type them in, stick your hand up or uh, yeah, just sort of jump in, but we'll allow some time at the end to uh, talk through some of the questions. And then once I'm finished, I'm gonna hand over to Pete and he's gonna walk through some of the technology that's used from a mapping perspective. I'll touch on some of it, but I won't go on any of the detail because I'll let Pete go through that. All right, so a brief history. I was trying to find a photo to bring up to represent history, so I thought I'd find the uh, earliest photo of me ballooning that I could find. So that's myself and my sister there in bare feet hanging onto the side of the basket. So that's just my proof that I've been around for a while. Um, but I thought I'd just sort of walk through the stages. So um, essentially when competition started in those early days, it was all about, it was still about accuracy of flying, but because pilots were sort of just getting better and better, it was all about trying to essentially fly and land your balloon near targets or near a point on a map. But also some of the technology that was introduced early was things like introducing barographs into the basket. And I won't go into too much detail about this because it was before my time, but uh, there's certainly some good books about and history around how competitions used to be very much about the skill of flying in terms of, for example, the task might be that you had to fly to a particular altitude and then sit at that altitude as level as you could for five minutes and then descend to another altitude and do the same. So there was different variations of tasks, but the barographs were probably one of the first essentially technologies that were introduced into the sport. But as I said, never used one, never seen one, so I'm not going to talk about it. But certainly in the uh, early, or before the 90s, basically, the way competitions really went was it was all about dropping markers. Um, and what we used to have is we used to have uh, observers that used to uh, be assigned to each balloon. And there are still a few events, like, for example, Saga, that still use observers. 
but uh, they tend not to be used anymore because unfortunately they, well, fortunately or unfortunately, depending who you talk to, they've been basically replaced by a lot of the technology we're using today. But the idea was you'd be flying to a target and it didn't matter where you were, you would still throw your marker. So we used to have, it used to be quite a, a totally different sport because you might completely miss your target. You might be a kilometre away from your goal. It didn't matter if you're over a forest or you're over a cornfield or something like that. You would still throw your marker out of the basket. And then after the flight, you would spend hours tramping through the bush, tramping through these cornfields and uh, paddocks trying to find your marker and then the observer would measure it for you and measuring was a science in itself in those circumstances because you'd have to measure the marker to the closest identifiable, fe identifiable feature on a map so it might be that you're 400 meters away from the closest um, intersection on a map and you would have to basically measure the the distance to that point using your compass and your tape measure, or in some circumstances, the observers would actually just pace out the distance. And that would be a way for the scorers to then be able to calculate what the distance was. So you would, after the flight was finished, you would, as I said before, you would spend a couple of hours searching for your markers in these horrible places, getting them out of trees, et cetera. And then you would be uh, doing a whole lot of measuring and geometry to find out what your result was. It was good fun, but it also meant you never got sleep during the day. Then, sort of in the late 90s, GPS kind technology came along, and it was in those days pretty inaccurate. Um, you're lucky if you're going to get a five meter five meter accuracy, especially during the times of say the Gulf War, where there was uh, errors introduced into GPS technology. Um, you can talk all about it a lot if you're a conspiracy theorist, but um, basically they weren't used for really accurate measurements, but they they were used by the observers to measure those markers that were in the middle of nowhere. So it kind of started helping um, helping with that scoring process. But what they would do is because they weren't so accurate, they would sit there with the GPS on your marker and take three or four or five measurements over a five minute period and then take the average of those positions just to get a little bit more accuracy. But also around this time is when we started using the GPSs in the basket as well. So um, technology certainly started coming into play. And then around the um, late nineties was when we started using uh, mapping technology on very old laptops uh, so Aussie Explorer has been around since then. And I remember when we first started using it, we'd have car batteries in the bottom of our baskets to plug our laptops in just to keep them alive for the couple of hours we needed to use them. And then around the mid 2000s is when the, um, the uh, ballooning commission actually took that GPS technology and introduced what is called the balloon, the first generation uh, balloon competition logger. And so these look like an instrument pack because they are built by um, Flytech, but these were um, developed to be a um, system that events could use and each pilot would be issued before a flight, one of these loggers. And then while you were flying, you would actually be declaring your goals and also using the buttons at the bottom to hit your logger marks, which essentially eliminated the need for us to be throwing markers into the middle of the bush because um, and I know last uh, seminar we were talking about the tasks and how they worked, but what they started introducing was this concept of the MMA where they would say, if you weren't within 100 metres of your target, don't throw the marker, hit the logger mark on the GPS, and that would be used for the result. So it kind of got rid of all that need for hunting for markers and doing very complex measurements. But what happened there was that these were, in most circumstances, events would actually have to order and rent these loggers from the CIA and have them sent to the event and used for the event. It wasn't a situation where everybody owned them or every country owned them. So I know in Australia, it was quite difficult for our nationals because we'd have to wait for these box of loggers to be freighted over to Australia to be used. Um, so 
this technology was great and however it started getting a bit old um, because it was the same devices that have been used for many many years but as i mentioned before that was kind of when the observers started and get started getting phased out so many events still use them but the loggers were kind of starting to that transition of moving observers away from competitions and we started going more to the technology side of things and then we come to now so in the little, sort of around 2019 um, we had two projects working parallel so i'd been building the watch me fly website which was sort of more focused on doing things like event management but at the same time the fai and the um the technology team within the ballooning commission started coming up with the concept of having a new logger to replace the old ones and what we did was um, essentially merge the two together because we realized that every pilot in their pocket had a mobile phone and everybody was used to using apps so the logical thing was to start moving the technology onto those devices to make it a lot more accessible so the balloon live app was developed and that was allowing pilots to use that same functionality of declaring goals hit, um, hitting logger marks and tracking all the data using the mobile phone and then the benefit of having it on a device like a phone was that we then could actually pass data in real time to um, the watch me fly website where we could collect the data and then start using it the difference between that and the old balloon live loggers was at the end of a flight with the old loggers you used to have to go back to the competition an official would take the sd card out of the um out of the logger they'd stick it in their computer and download your tracks whereas what this is allowing to do is it happens in real time so there's no need to actually essentially go back to the competition center which again saves a huge amount of time uh, for pilots and officials during competitions the other piece of technology sitting there is the balloon life sensor and i'm going to talk through how this all works together all right so that's my history lesson um but what i thought i'd do is now dive into the, those technologies and just talk about them in a little bit more detail i'm i'm very aware that some people on the phone have used these quite a lot but feel free to throw in any other comments that you wish okay so what we've got is basically three uh things in this mix so we have the balloon live app in the center which runs on your phone or your tablet device we have the balloon live sensor on the left hand side which is a um, fai uh, commissioned uh, gps and barometric uh, altimeter all come sort of compacted into this little box and i'll explain why we use that in a minute and then we have watch me fly which is the website so just looking a little bit more detail at each of these so the balloon live app as i mentioned it's the official um, competition logger now uh, to put it in perspective last year there was i think 47 events around the world that used this app for ca capturing data and that included the worlds it included a lot of uh, national championships so it's pretty much the the device that most events are using this day and what the app is doing it's as soon as you take off and hit the start button it tracks a, your um, track points and normally that's once every second anytime you hit a logger goal or a logger um, a goal declaration it's capturing that and as i mentioned before it's transmitting that in real time to uh, the watch me fly system the app works on any android or any modern android and apple device so you can actually use it on your ipad or your tablet um, device as well as on your mobile phones some of the uh, some of us older folks are starting to use the uh, tablets just because it's easier to read the writing on them plus the buttons are easier to hit and then it also runs in two modes so you can actually download this at any time from the, the app store or the android store and it has a training mode so you can run at any time you can practice using the um the app in training mode it won't send any data to watch me fly and there are a few limitations with it but you can certainly get used to going for a flight declaring goals and dropping markers so i highly recommend you do that however the thing about mobile phones is everybody's phone's different every phone has a different gps um, sensor in it and from a competition perspective 
we needed a way to standardize the data that is being captured. So what was developed was what's known as the balloon live sensor. So this is a, it's a small device. It's a little bit smaller than your mobile phone. And it's basically a GPS. And it's also got a barometric out um, altimeter in it. So the reason that's important is because if you've got 100 balloons using 100 different mobile phones trying to capture data, everything you're going to get a lot of discrepancy in the type of technology. You might have people with old phones, new phones, all sorts of things. So the sensor is a way that we could have a system that these devices, so your mobile phone can connect to via Bluetooth, and we had that consistency of data that came through. The other thing is that mobile phones do not have barometric altitude. They rely on GPS altitude, which is, for those who know, they're not very accurate in terms of altitude. You can get 100 foot discrepancies. So when it comes to tasks that altitude is uh, of, uh, of concern or required, you need something that's providing barometric altitude. But it's a great little unit. It's very simple. You basically just turn it on and it does its thing. Um, I, you can actually use it connected not only to the Balloon Live app, but you has another Bluetooth um, connection that you can use to connect your laptop um, or any of the other tools you're using for navigation. Um, so I actually use this as my, my daily GPS, even when it's not competition. I just turn it on and connect my laptop to it and use it all the time. The other difference between it and the um, the older loggers is that typically this is owned by the pilot themselves. So when you go to a competition that's using the balloon live technology, there's normally a requirement in the rule book that the pilot must provide their own sensor. Many countries, so I know Australia, Japan, the US have actually the, the balloon clubs and the federations have bought sets of them that they can rent out or provide to pilots. But typically, it's the, it's the pilot's responsibility to provide one. But I will note they do have an electronic seal on them. So if anybody tries to open them up and check to see how they work inside, they've been designed to be tamper-proof. So yes, you need to, uh, if as soon as you crack open the, the packet of it, uh, you'll find that you can't use it until you get approval. OK, um, I'll come back to the questions in a second. Um, but then the final piece of technology, and this is the bit that I've been most res um, responsible for and using, is Watch Me Fly. So as I mentioned before, this is a website that was developed to kind of help run events. So initially it was all about um, getting pilot lists up onto the website and allowing the director to publish the task data sheets on the website. But over the last few years, it's kind of grown into a, a bit of a monster in terms of the uh, what it does, because... There are a whole lot of different functions in there now. So things like digital um, flight report forms, providing different data visualizations. So when that balloon live data comes in, there's all sorts of maps and graphs that you can look at. It. We have um, a tool that allows the target team to um, be out in the field and digitally just put all the measurements as they measure the markers at targets. So that data in real time goes back to the scoring teams. Plus, there's a whole lot of scoring functionality in there now. So using all that balloon live data and the target team data to allow scorers to essentially just hit a button and score tasks automatically using all that data. And I'll show that very briefly later on. If there's anyone interested in the whole scoring side of things, there is actually a training um, a course and certification you can do. Uh, within Watch Me Fly. So you, you can go and spend three hours watching videos and listening to me talk and do exercises in your own event and learn and practice scoring. I think we've got about 80 certified scorers now and quite a few over there in the UK. All right. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a demo of how this tech all works now. Um, but I thought there was a question there. I might just check what that was. Uh, I'm just talking about the standardization. Yes. Um, I know a lot of phones do now have barometric sensors, but obviously, yeah, we, <laughs> if the last worlds is anything to go by, you're still seeing people that are trying to connect very old phones. We've even had people ask questions about using old Nokias and stuff. Um, my recommendation anyway is if you're going to a, a competition like a Nationals or Worlds, 
make sure you've got decent gear. Um, last thing you want to do is take off and have technology failures or just have inaccurate data because it's not, you can't protest or complain about your results if your technology is old or not so good. Any other questions before I dive into a bit of a demo of how it all works? No, excellent. No. <laughs> all right. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to switch screens and I'm going to jump into my phone. Actually, what we'll do, let me step back a bit. All right. What I'm showing you here, I'm going to walk through a bit of a simulation of um, what you would do on a typical competition flight or a competition day. So I've created a, an event here, which is called the 2023 Australian Competition. So it's just a demo dummy event. Um, but what you pilots would do in the morning is, well, the director would do in the morning is create a flight with all the task data and whether they upload their own um, PDF paper um, task data sheet or they use the Watch Me Fly uh, data sheet, what you'll be able to do is come in and look at the event and see what the task data is. So here we've got the flight two, which is happening on the 27th of March. And there's the task data sheet sitting here. And I'm gonna walk through this task very quickly, but basically what we have here is two tasks, one's a fly in and then one's a fly on. So what we can see here is the fly in task has a goal or a target with a 50 meter MMA, which basically means if you don't get your marker within 50 meters of the, of the target, you're going to need to use your logger and drop a logger mark. So that's going to be using logger mark one. And then the second task is a fly on. And that one, we have to declare a goal into logger goal one before we finish the task, task one. So it basically means before you drop your marker at the target or hit the logger goal, you have to do a declaration of a goal or your own goal within the Balloon Live app. And that has to be a 4-4 coordinate. So pretty. this is a very standard set of tasks, having a fly in. You might normally have a couple of tasks in between and then have a fly on that you have to do something in the logger to declare your own goal. So what we're gonna do is I'm now gonna switch over to my phone. Let me just, hopefully technology will work here. And I'm going to go in here, and this is what you would do when you were in, if you were in a briefing. So you'll come into the Balloon Live app and you'll open this up. <sighs> I'm not connected to the Balloon Live sensor because I'm sitting in the lounge room. So you'll see that error shows up saying it's disconnected because at least with my mobile phone, when you're sitting inside, it can kind of still get coordinates based on the, um, the cell phone service. But here we're in the app and you can see it's already looking at our position. Um, but up at the top here at the top, you'll see it's in training mode. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna switch this into competition mode. So we do that by going to actions and we're gonna ch change that to be into my login. So you will actually log into your app using your Watch Me Fly credentials. And once you log in, you're able to select from all the competitions you're registered for. So you can see here, I'm actually signed up to a number of different events. So there's a Balloon Live event running. We've got our Australian Nationals coming up in May. So I'm already set up for that one. And then we can see we've got that competition, which is the 2003 Australian one. So I'm gonna load that one up. When I do that, what it does is it actually goes to Watch Me Fly and says, all right, give me all the information about any flights that are available currently. So you'll see in the top right-hand corner, it's already worked out that we're about to fly flight number two. And what that also has done is it's gone and got the uh, Q&H that the director has set up in the task. And that's gonna feed that information to the Balloon Live sensor so that the Balloon Live sensor is using the right Q&H for the, um, the barometric altitude. So all that happens in the background. Okay, so that's kind of the first step is making sure the flight's ready to go. Then when you're out in the field and you've inflated the balloon, uh, a few minutes before you plan to take off, you want this all up and running. And then when you're ready to go, you basically hit the start flight. And that means that it is actually gonna start, and that means it's actually started tracking. 
So now data is being passed. Every track point, uh, basically a track point every one second is being sent over to watch me fly and you're ready to go. So let's say we're flying along and we're going towards our first target, which is that fly in target and decide that we're not actually going to get that close to the goal. What you're going to do is as you're approaching the target, the first thing you do is you hit the drop button and say, I'm going to get ready to drop logger mark one, because that was what was specified in the task sheet. And that's ready there. It's basically armed and ready to go. So as I fly along and get close to my goal or as close as I possibly can, so probably head down looking at the laptop, trying to work out the closest point, when you're ready to go, you basically just hit the drop button and that records the mark that you've dropped it. So we can see in there, if I come down to uh, the, the marker drops, I can see a number one. I can click on that and see all the information about when that was dropped. Okay. I did actually skip a step there because before I dropped that, I should have declared my uh, goal. So let's pretend I didn't drop that marker. But I'm going to declare that uh, logger goal one for my fly on. And here you can see I can just come in here and chuck in a 4-4 four, four coordinate and even an altitude if the task requires. And I've now declared my goal. And then as I fly along to my fly on goal, again, just hit number two because that was the mark I have to drop at that one. And then as soon as I'm close enough, I hit drop two. And then that's been recorded. And then after that, I go off and land in my paddock. And this is what a lot of pilots forget to do, but you actually have to come in here and hit stop flight. And by hitting stop flight, that means that the flight is recorded as finished and the score is no, you're all done. The reason I said a lot of pilots forget to do that is the number of times that I've seen data of people driving back to breakfast and sitting in, even at the US Nationals, I had great um, somebody was tracking for a couple of hours. I could see them walking around inside Walmart and I had to ring them and tell them to turn their tracker off because I knew exactly what, <laughs> what they're up to. So I do ask you do stop that because it's a huge amount of data that we end up collecting. And it's also a bit of a pain having to track, work out what pilots were doing when you can see them driving home. All right, so that was all the stuff that was happening in the logger. What I'll do is switch back and show you what that looks like in Watch Me Fly. So as a pilot, I'm able to come in and log into my account in Watch Me Fly. And what we can see here is that we actually have a lot of information about the flight that just occurred. So we can see here that my Balloon Live app has finished tracking because we hit the stop button. We also have, if they're using digital flight report forms and dropping markers, we can get a record of whether um, the pilots have filled those, or whether you filled those in. So this is a bit of a checklist to make sure you've done everything you need to do post-flight. But we're also able to look at things like the data and also a Google map of what we just did. You're also able as a pilot to come in and look at all of your data from every flight and every competition you've done previously. So here we can see We've got all the data from this competition. So flight two, flight one. I can look at a map. It's not gonna be very interesting because I'm sitting in my lounge room. Um, but if I come here and look at a previous flight, this is one based out of Canoundra, we can see all of the information here about my launch point, where the logger drops were, even in reference to where the targets were. And you can see the whole detail of what's happened in the map and what you've done and where you've landed. So I really recommend that after you've done your flight, you do come in and just double check this because it just gives you a good visual to make sure that everything looks like you expect. There's no data discrepancies. There's no logger marks that you accidentally hit in the wrong spot. It's just a nice way of re reviewing it to check everything's correct. You can also download all the data in an Aussie target uh, format. So if you want to bring that onto your laptop and compare things with what you had done on your laptop, you can also do all of that. So as a pilot, you've got the visibility. You have the same visibility to the data as uh, you do, um, as the officials do as well. You can even come in and get all the details of the coordinates, what your declarations were. Everything's um, visible to you.
All right, so that's the pilot view. Now, I'm going to log in now as basically as a competition official. So when you log in as an official, if you've been assigned to an event, you actually have access to the competition center. So I'm just going to jump in and check questions here. Oh, okay. I think I just answered the question about where we see it. Um, Yes. Okay. So two questions here. Um, William was asking if in that scenario where I declared my goal after I dropped my marker, the answer is yes, they will be out. The scorers will be able to see that I've done it in the wrong order and penalize me correctly. In fact, the scoring's got things built into it to double check that automatically. So it will automatically flag to the scorers that Robbo actually declared his goal after he dropped logger mark one so you can't cheat is the short answer there and then where do we see the flight the data um post flight i think that's basically what i just showed you there is you can see it all there we store the data for um well and truly months after the um after the event as well as on your app you can always check the data um within the app after the flight and after the event as well so you've got a lot of visibility into what data has been captured. All right, so now we're in the competition center and I'm going to, as an official, come into the event that we're flying. So this is the uh, 2013, sorry, 2023 competition. And this is the dashboard that the officials would see. So there's a lot of information here. I'm not gonna walk through everything. Um, there's plenty of training videos on it. But what we can see here is we can see the flight to which is currently still live because we've still got balloons probably flying and tracking. We can see the task information, but the, the officials can also see the status of everybody's tracks and whether they've been scored and whether they've submitted their flight report forms. This one's pretty boring because we only had that one track there. But if I come back to the previous flight, which was flight one, we can see I've got a little bit more data here. So we can actually see that my result has been started scoring. We've got a flight report form filled out. We've got a track. It's automatically worked out that I've got some penalties and that we're still waiting for my markers to come in. So the scorers have a good visual of all the things that are going on. They can also jump in and get that same view of all the data that we were just showing before. But where it becomes quite useful for them is the speed of scoring. So I mentioned before, it was quite slow in the days we had to download the tracks off the old loggers and then that had to be plugged into scoring systems and then uh, officials had to check things and calculate things and results would take hours, if not days to come out. But the idea behind what we're doing with this data now is that we can come into a task and the scorers can basically just hit a button and it will process all of the balloon live data and the target team data, and straight away it will calculate the results that that pilot has got. And we can apply that data and be very quick at getting provisional results out. So as simple as hitting that button, that button then generating, and then generating a provisional result is all that the scorers need to do to start getting results published on the website. So it's very fast. What you can do is here, as you can see, this 144 meters that's been calculated has actually been calculated using those, um, the data that we've just been sending from Balloon Live. So we can come in here and have a look and say, all right, Watch Me Fly has worked out that the results 144 meters, and it's based that information using logger mark one and logger goal one that has come through that Balloon Live data. And then here we can see that the intelligent um, data has been using all that data um, and gives you all the information so that scorers can check everything's correct. So that's, I mean, I'm not going to go through the whole way that scoring works. As I said, there's a whole training course on it, um, but it's certainly just showing you how data is very quickly sent from the basket all the way through to, um, through to the scorers. The first time we tested this in Canoundra, I actually had we were flying in Australia. I was competing. We did the first task was a pilot declared goal, and Paul Petron was over in the US scoring us remotely using this. 
And just to test it out, we I told him when I was about to hit my logger mark, I hit the mark and then within a minute, he had published the provisional results on the website for my result. And that was kind of our first sort of sudden realization that this was a new way of scoring and that we could actually get results out really quickly where we suddenly realized that there may be issues with the rules that we're publishing results before the balloons have even landed or other pilots have actually hit their logger marks. So it's, it was a totally new concept when it came to speed of scoring. All right, any questions? Okay. Uh, we often use remote sensors. Uh, so can we still access the, the data? Not quite sure, Richard, if I understand that question. Oh, and you're on mute. <laughs> no, you might Sorry, be on mute. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if, if the score is, if we're doing an event in Gloucester and the score is in um, Australia, can we yep. still can we still see that? Can we go somewhere to see that? That page, or do we do we have to log into the to the scoring system somewhere? Yeah, uh, the officials. Uh, you mean somebody? If you want to, as do you just want to watch where somebody's tracking or what they're doing? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, you said it's a good idea after the flight to pop in. Oh, and yeah, your track, didn't you? But yes, absolutely. It doesn't matter where sure, you are. So I'm not sure how you do that as a pilot. As, as a pilot, you as soon as you log in to watch me fly you have will automatically have access to all of your data. And if you, you'll see there's links all over the place. So it says your balloon live data here. It says you'll be, have links up here as well. But as soon as you go in there, and because I've obviously done a lot of events, it will just keeps a record of every flight you've done and has the data available. So that's basically what you do is you just go to the homepage and watch me fly, and then you'll have access to it all. Okay. Cool. All right, I know I'm going a bit over time, so I just wanted to finally jump in and just talk a little bit about the technology and what you need in the basket itself. So let me just bring up my slides again. Oops, hang on, they're the ones we didn't want to see. All right. So the basket setup. What I'll do is I'll sort of walk through sort of the bare minimum of what you need um, and then kind of build it up to what we're tending to use now and certainly what I'm using in the basket. So at the most basic level, to go and compete, you generally will need a Balloon Live app and the sensor. There are actually some competitions that don't use the sensor or they're optional. And so they're more your sort of fun weekend events that just want to have some fun competition. They might just use the Balloon Live app and not even use the sensor and just rely on the phone's GPS. But certainly at a nationals or anything that's a little bit more official, that's where the sensor will come into play. And they connect to each other via Bluetooth. What a lot of pilots will be doing though is they'll also have their own uh, tablet, like their own um, Windows machine in the basket and be running something like Aussie Explorer. And that's what Pete's gonna talk about shortly. As I mentioned before, you can connect that directly to the sensor. And it's a big advantage to do that rather than running at a different GPS because if you're using Aussie Explorer, you kind of want it using exactly the same data as your Balloon Live app because you want the arrow and all your planning that's happening on uh, Aussie Explorer to be using that exact same data, same altitude, exact, et cetera. So typically you'll see a lot of pilots will have both of these systems running in the basket. What is now happening a lot in uh, competitions, it's certainly something that's been released in the last year. Um, Australia's been doing this for quite a while, but the um, Aussie Target, which is an extension to Aussie Explorer that Sean Kavanagh has built and has been used for by many pilots over the years, is basically a plugin that has a lot of ballooning functionality and stuff specific to competition that can be added to Aussie Explorer. Aussie Explorer was actually built for four wheel drivers originally, but it's been adapted for ballooning. But what has recently come out is a, an option to subscribe to, which allows you to actually track what other pilots are doing. So what you'll see here is that you have your um, track on your computer, but then you could also see what other people in your team, including your crew are doing. So rather than radioing 
Matt and saying what altitude, have, what direction have you got at 2,000 feet, you can actually see it all on your screen, what he's doing, as well as what you're, you're doing yourself. So a lot of countries are now doing this. The Worlds in um, Slovenia was sort of the first big event that many teams were running this sort of idea. So we're seeing a lot more of that now. And then this is kind of the ideal setup. This is what I'm running in the basket. Um, the main difference here is it's a really good idea just to have, it's technology, things go wrong. Um, and it's always good to have backups. So what I actually do is I have a dedicated iPhone that is purely running the app. And then I have my backup phone in my pocket. Because what you don't want to be doing is taking selfies and videoing and doing Facebook Live on the same device as you're using to actually capture all your competition data. But if something was happened to go wrong with your main phone, like the battery goes flat or you drop it over the side, it's always good to have a backup in your pocket that you can turn on and then connect. And the same thing happens with GPS. Like a number of times I've had Bluetooth connection issues with my Surface tablet. Um, it's good just to have another GPS in the basket so that you can either connect to it or use it as your backup. So this is kind of the extreme ideal view of the types of technology that we'd be running. And that's my time up. Any questions? I know that was a big brain dump of technology. Yes, want to um, Robbie, great presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, is there any connectivity between the Flytech logger and memory map as opposed to, I know Aussie it'll, it will work. It's been built around Aussie, so that's fine. But what about the old British memory map? I can't answer direct because I've never used it, but basically it's nothing to do with the software. It's more to do with the device being able to connect to Bluetooth. So essentially whatever the device, whether it's a tablet or a laptop, if it can connect to a Bluetooth, external Bluetooth GPS, then generally it should be okay. But maybe someone else on the call might have experience with memory. So, Richard, I, I, I've been able to do that without any problems. Um, you want to call me sometime, we can chat about it, what I'm doing now. Okay, Pat, cheers. Uh, William's asking, so if you end up, up having to use your backup, do you also need to be able to download the GPX for the scorers? Okay, so if you end up using a backup, if you use a, your backup app, so if you, say I drop my phone over the side of the basket and then I pull my other phone out and connect Balloon Live and start tracking, it will. you can run multiple versions of Balloon Live and pass the data. In fact, sometimes I'll run two devices and have two tracks being sent to the officials. You probably just need to go and explain to them why there's two tracks. But you can only have one that you're declaring goals on. So, oh, and hitting logger marks, because if you have two phones that you're declaring mm. the same goals and the dropping the same markers on, it's going to cause all sorts of confusion and you'll probably find the rules will hit you pretty hard, but at least you're getting the track data. Well, um, so you don't need to, in the old days, you used to have, you'd run your old GPS and if your um, FAI logger didn't work, you'd take your uh, GPX file and give it to them. You generally don't need to do that because the live data will be passed over to them from both apps. Did that answer that question, Mr. Wood? I'm taking, yes, good. <laughs> Anything else before I throw over to Pete? Nope, Pete, it's all yours. Hello. Turn that down. Sorry, me and Dan are on the same uh, room. Um, it is off mute. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Cheers, Dan, for that. Um, let me load this up. So, yeah, thanks for that, Robbo. I remember a few things that you um, said there, especially the recording the flight track. I remember Worlds last year being upstairs in a restaurant, getting a phone call or a text from you saying, turn your bloody logger off. Mm -hmm. And I run downstairs, run past you in the same restaurant to go to the van to turn off my phone and all the sharing. So um, that was good fun. Let me just try and I'm share. I'm not shy to send invoices for data consumption either. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have been a big bill. It's always after a bad flight as well. So 
you just thought, oh, screw it. <laughs> um, can you see my screen? I'm Ooh, not an um, expert like Robbo on this, so hopefully um, I can get this going. I've already cocked up. Stand by. There we go. Is that good? Oh, we can see your slide notes though. Sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, as I said, not an expert. I know how to fix this thing. <laughs> Perfect. Okie dokie. So yeah, so I'm going to go a bit more into the, you know, competition nav technology that we're using and um, then further on to the main software that everyone around the world uses, so which is Aussie, but I'm going to go a little bit over memory map and the more basic software that we can use and that probably the majority of pilots in the UK have access to at the moment and are, and are currently using. So, yeah, the basic ones, you've got Hot Air, uh, which is only for the iOS. You've got Memory Map. Uh, Memory Map, I think, just over the winter, have just released a universal um, software, which um, is pretty much the similar or exactly the same on iPhone, Android, and the PC, if you want to be able to use that just to get used to the same kind of technology. Um, Android, you've got JBlueNav. I don't personally use this because I don't really run any Android devices, but I think there might be a couple of specific nav you know, competition features that you would be able to use. But then when you're starting to take competitions a little bit more seriously and you're flying with a PC in your basket, um, the UK guys up until about five years ago, I'd say, were mainly using memory map until we kind of all transitioned over just to use um, the major features that um, that Aussie target can give you for the competition specific um, tasks. Uh, we'll go through a little bit more of that later on. So your first competition that uh, you're flying, whether it's just a GP, um, which hopefully a lot of you guys are going to be doing, or the New Beginnings next month in a couple of weeks um what do you need what do you need to turn up with um the most basic one is um the app if you can just download the blfs app that robbo's just talked about and you can have a play with that for for like new beginnings and gps um i'm pretty sure the comps club are not going to require you guys to use those loggers um but because, as you said, you can just use the um, the GPS and the barometer in your phone to give you a good good enough score um, that the most of the scorers will be happy with for those short, those small kind of competitions. But saying that, and to contradict what Robbo said, um, the Comps Club, the British Comps Club, own about twenty of those devices and have handed them out to their main competitors. And I think we still got a few in the in the bank that if there's any new competitors joining, we can kind of loan them out to um, members um, to, in order them to gain practice and then use them at our nationals and international events where they actually require to use them. Um, and then a computer, are you going to need a computer in your first competition? I wouldn't say so. Most of you probably are flying with a tablet with memory maps uh, or hot air or something like that. And you can put a lot of useful information, which I'm guessing a lot of people don't actually do on their everyday flight. They just use it to look up um, like field boundaries or and roads where they're flying to and mainly avoid PZs. But, you know, you can start to use those basic applications for the competition features to to plan your flight to plan your flight better than you're currently you know doing just eyeballing a target in the middle of a field that you roughly know where it is uh and then yeah 
even on paper, you know, if you're only rocking paper, you can you can still do basic tasks. And the most important thing about competition ballooning has and always will be flying, flying the balloon into a target visually. You know, the the computers are good to get you to the field and obviously the other targets in 3D targets, but you know, if you get to a field, then you need to get from the boundary of the field over the cross of the cent over the center of the cross. And um, that comes down to the pure skill of the pilot, really. And the computer and the system's not going to use that. So basically, what I'm saying is encouraging you all to go for a go for the targets when they're at your local balloon meet and the competition that you're flying in. So we go for memory map, it's probably the most commonly used app in the UK. Um, it's available on all devices and I, it's now free to download. You just have to pay for the OS maps in the UK. Um, pretty, pretty reasonable actually. I think you can buy a map for six, buy the entire of the UK for 16 pounds for the year. Or if you wait for a sale, um, you can buy an entire, you, and then you can own that map for the entire life. It just, you know, gets updated. So you're going to slowly run off outdated um, information. And, you know, that I think I bought that last year for £20. And then I can put that across like five or 10 different devices. So that's, you know, you can run memory map on your PC for 20 quid for life, effectively, which is pretty good um but yeah as i said it's it's very basic you're not going to get all the functionalities but you can get a hell of a lot of functionalities better than paper you've got the moving map that's going to follow you and you can drop mark the you know targets in the field and then you can navigate towards those targets and that will give you you know precise eta on your current speed and whether you're going to need to turn left or right to go to it a, there's lots of different things especially with the new um, BBAC system for the PZs that you can just download and upload them straight onto your iPad or laptop you know I'm driving to a launch site now and I'm just in the car I can be checking that my maps are up to date and if they're not I can put new PZs on the map within 30 seconds because it, it runs flawlessly with um, memory map. So that's pretty good. Um, on to, so for the mobile device, there's just a screenshot here of my iPad. You've got the two basic um, kind of functions and these kind of red crosses that I've dropped. And you can go in and you can select the exact coordinate and move them around quite easily. You can change the crosses to pins or little boats or these are actually um, to the top and the bottom of the screen. You've got the PZs. Um, so you can see a little house and a deer. And the blue lines that you see there, they're kind of tracks that we use for kind of projected winds. So if you know on the surface, the wind is kind of, you know, going 250, you kind of put that in so that when you're approaching the goal, you don't really want to come down later than that because if you come down any later than that, you're not going to gain any more um, left. So you're going to shoot straight past it. So you kind of use that to stay within those arrows. And that's just kind of a bit of like competition flying mentality as you're looking at the, the, the tasks in front of you and kind of planning your flight and approaches into these goals. Um, we can go on to the PC here. Memory maps on the PC. Uh, it's got all the same functionalities as on the mobile device. I think there's only pretty much one extra um, function. But some of the other guys in the chat that uh, use it, I think some of you still do use it. Um, let me know if there's anything different. But um, the main difference, I think, is um, this one here, the way in the, the photo in the middle, you've got um, the, tar the rings around the waypoint. But that's another limiting factor of this software is you can only have one ring per waypoint. So I think uh, 
Tom sent me these images and I'm guessing Tom must have two waypoints dropped at the same location, one with a uh, 500 meter radius and one with a one kilometer radius um, in order to get those two rings, which is just a little bit of hassle whilst you're flying, but it's useful in some of the tasks, which I'm going to go over in a little bit more detail of why they may be useful. Um, in a moment and yeah you've got the same functionalities you can drop the waypoints and move them around enter the exact coordinates etc and create the tracks there on the right that's your kind of projected path um and then yeah this is the kind of page um i think richard and pat were talking about earlier where you can go through and you can connect a external gps to the device to get that higher accuracy and then that will also be the same GPS that you're using on the system and the watch me fly. So what you're actually going to be recorded to. And that looks like a fun flight that Thomas had. Morning flight with lots of steerage, I'm guessing. I can't see anything. Apparently someone's chatting. Do you wanna... I can intervene if you want, Pete. Go. Yeah, so just going back to that previous slide with the uh, marker on the um, on the intersection on the road there, you are right. It is um, the one of the limits with memory maps is that you can put one marker, uh, for example, on the intersection if that's why your goal is, or in the middle of a field if you've chosen some coordinates. Um, so in order to um, let's the reason we're talking about rings is for donuts. So in order to um, you know. Uh, project your own uh, donut is is you know you're gonna have to put two markers down because you're like pete said you can only put one ring around um a single target coordinate so what i've actually done there is put one down you have to zoom in as far as you can on the memory map software and uh put another one down and basically put a you know your your inner radius and your outer radius and then um you know fly within those so, so although it looks like one marker it is two i'm just reading the chat now tom pat's actually just said that that is a new update that you can add five rings to a, to a specific oh, okay yeah fair enough um, yeah we obviously haven't updated that for a while but yeah it is a it is a feature of the app as well I've, i mean i've not used it for a few years but that that's how we used to do it and um, there we go I don't know if you can see that on my screen, but there is a feature of the app. You get a number of rings. You can specify the distance between those rings. But the the approach that you were talking about there on that junction where you want more than one ring, what I always do is I copy the position coordinates and then create a new waypoint and paste the position coordinates in again and specify the radius I want. So it's very easy to do. If, you, if you're used to doing it, you could do it very quickly. So it's not really a limitation. It's just the way it works yeah exactly so it's still you can always make your way around it and complete any task sheet with this it's just um a little bit of fiddling and getting used to it's not built specifically for competitions but it's a very good um free application that we can anyone can get their hands on and get into competition ballooning quite quite easily with um moving on if no one's got any more questions it's the same as that um hot air so this is actually the least useful app for competition ballooning um you can't upload any os maps to it um but you can put pzs on it quite easily it's only on uh, iphone ipad it just cost cost 10 pounds to download um so if we're this is just another screenshot of my iPad here. The one useful competition feature is that you can long press on the screen. I don't know if a lot of people know about this, but if you long press on a screen, it comes up with that target that's kind of drawn on. And that then just gives you distance bearing and an ETE to it. So um, you can use that in order to get you to one target and that's it really you know you can only do one at a time you can't really you can't change it to be specific with grid coordinates or anything like that um but then 
yeah, it's still helping you navigate to a target. So if you're competing at like Bristol or Longleat and they say, oh, there's a target in this field, you can pop that straight in and that will help you get there. Um, there's not much more you can do. Um, the other useful, really useful thing that this does have, which memory map doesn't have, to my understanding, is um, this wind data window that I've pulled out. Um, you can kind of change the the data there, but once you're flying, it will um, record your last kind of velocity when you're flying through that, alti that altitude. So, and then it will give you the speed and the heading that you're doing so that later on in the flight, you can go, oh, I really need this kind of direction or I need to find the max speed I can to get me somewhere. You're gonna, you can pull that back out and have a look at it and use that data. So um, it's really useful in the UK, especially if you're wanting to look for somewhere to land or something, you need to find that, you know, that's, that's quite a useful, important bit. And then the satellite, always useful, especially when you're flying kind of commercially and, and you want to look for tracks into the field, which again, you won't have on memory maps or anything like that. Um, slightly off topic, but that's kind of my, when I'm flying balloons commercially, I use this, um, I use an iPad and I have both hot air and memory maps loaded at the same time. So I've got the I've best. Got the best. Oh, I've got the best of both um, OS and uh, hot air that I can pull out the wind data and use that. I can you look at the the flight, you know, the satellite imagery in detail and also OS maps. So, and then, you know, especially when I'm flying competitions or practicing when I'm flying commercially, I'll put these um, crosses down. I can tell my crew to go and park up there and then I'll go and put a couple of um, baggies on the back of the flatbed and just practicing and using those kind of basic things software to navigate me into a target. Um, moving on to the more up-to-date competition specific software that Robbo did touch a bit we've got um, Aussie Explorer and Aussie Target. So um, Aussie Explorer is like a navigation software which was built by, uh, I think he said, the 4 by 4 riders, drivers in uh, Australia. And it, I think it's open source, which just means you can like, add to it and take away from it, which uh, Sean Kavanagh did with um, creating the Aussie Target, which is the competition-specific feature of it. Um Again, you can connect the GPS just for higher accuracy. Um, all in all, I think the initial investment to get Aussie Explorer and Aussie Target up and running on a PC is about £150 nowadays. Um, and yeah, I think everyone at the Worlds in this year, pretty last year, pretty much used the software. And it's, yeah, it's just got so many useful tools that we'll talk about now which help help you in your competition flight so if we go on to the um the core features in the in aussie uh, explorer on in aussie target sorry you've got um the task rings which we were just kind of having that discussion there you can they're very useful for setting minimum maximum distances from to goals from like the launch sites or anything like that it sometimes it says or also your declaration or something like the pdg has to be at least one kilometer away from where you launch so where you're launching you drop a waypoint and you draw a one kilometer ring around that and you know that you can't put any um waypoints closer than that um the waypoint tool just really useful you can move uh, waypoints around the nearest meter or 10 meters so get it really specific when you're when you're loading it in and then you can name them color them shape them completely differently and uh, flight winds is very similar to what hot air had had and then scoring areas that's a really good kind of one that we've got you can really specifically draw 
um, areas on a map that you're going to be scoring in. We'll just go into a little bit more information with all of these in a second. So yeah, this is a kind of a screenshot, a very cluttered screenshot of the majority of features that Hot Air, oh, Aussie Explorer, Aussie Target offers. Um, so if we start from left to right, the flight winds, that's the same as what we talked about on Hot Air, but you can really specify what you want. I, I think I'm normally flying with about a 50 foot difference just to try and gather as much information that I can. And then they nicely color code um color code it so it gives you your altitude direction and speed that's the scoring functions that i talked about so in the top you've got the scoring areas where you can draw around like roads or um you know specific areas that the director said that you can that you can uh only score in and then the easting and northing line if you see in the middle of the screen that um, vertical red line that kind of just snaps that to a specific, I think that's nine five. Um, so I'll explain all of that in a little bit more detail in a second. The wind reader um, function, basically, I think nowadays they're using pieballs in a lot of competitions, and you can load data straight from the gun into Aussie Target, and then you can paint that straight on your computer screen to see where you want to launch from or where you want to set your first PDG, et cetera. Um, task rings, that's kind of what we discussed. And the useful function down here, you've got, um, you can put it in, you know, you can go the entire way around the waypoint that you've dropped it in, or if you press the one next to it, it looks like the Wi-Fi kind of signal. That just draws it in one direction specifically, just because um, if you're obviously just flying in one direction, you don't want to clutter the entire map, so that just helps helps with that. Um, and then, if we look at the the Aussie target, the main colourful window on the right hand side, that's the kind of screen which is always there, and you control everything from and get all your information from. Um, the yeah, the really useful thing about that is it the elevation feature. I find that if you download the elevation on the map it tells you the the current you know the elevation of the ground below you at the exact time that you're flying which which just helps your situational awareness and your onward planning of goals um and then it also then works out for the above ground level so the distance you are above the ground versus sea level or whatever qnh you put in and then in the top bar of the Aussie Explorer, you actually see where it says elevation 342 feet. So that's when you're dragging your um, mouse around the map, that's telling you the elevation below the specific point of your mouse, which again, for when you're dropping a PDG target, you, you can see where it is. And if you want to put the PDG at 10 feet above the ground, because that's where you think you're going to get the best steerage. Um, you can just go up like, 342 plus 10 and punch that into your um, app that you're using. Um, I've got a lot of chats. Can I take a second to read through them? Or is that... Is my admin doing that? I've been answering them for you in the background. No, oh, thanks. You are you are now my official... <laughs> Sorry. And can I just jump in there, Pete? Can I just make a comment, Pete? Go um, for it. I know looking at that screen is very overwhelming. Um, one, I've been obviously using Aussie for a long time. One thing that I've learned is it's really good for each competition you go to or each flight, just focus on one of the functionalities to sort of perfect it. Um, so you can start very basic, but you know, it might be that this flight, I really want to start getting used to using the flight winds. And you just kind of just focus on one piece of the functionality per flight. And it's just a really nice way of starting to work out a, how it works, but B, how it's going to work for the way you fly. So there are things that I don't use. There are things that I use all the time, and it just varies from pilot to pilot, just based on the way you like to, to operate in the in the flight. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's why, you know, if when I'm leading up to a competition, I'll switch from, like, flying with my iPad to flying with 
hot air all the time just to get used to it and then you just add on those um bits of use extra kind of stuff and you're using them all the time just to make yourself more fluid with the software because it just takes a bit of time to get used to and there are still functions that i don't really use you know to the full extent like the multiple targets at the bottom okay. where you can kind of navigate towards two different targets i've used that in the past but i like at the last worlds i don't think i use that whatsoever but um and on that yeah Aussie Target, uh, Sean's created a really good YouTube channel called Aussie Target. I've got the link at the end of the slides, um, which he goes through pretty much all the functions individually. And normally at the beginning of the season, I go on to Aussie Target and I just refresh myself. I spend, you know, each day I'll just watch a different video of his and that just jogs back memories and how I'm using those kind of features. Uh, um so yeah if we continue so yeah that that right hand side all that that kind of all populates with information once you connect your external gps or if your device has got one in it and that's the point kind of aussie is built for people with you know touch screens as well so i know a lot of people just use a surface pro and don't even have a keyboard they use their finger or like a pen to press the screen so everything's kind of got a function that when you tap it you know numbers can come out and you can punch it in with your finger which is really useful so if we go to the next slide i'm going to talk about just an example flight from nationals i'm going to run through it with aussie because I think that's where you got a lot of the useful features. And I'm just going to take it task by task and go through kind of what what I'm doing in a typical flight. Because I, I, I like learning by examples. And again, any of the pilots that were completing at Nationals, chip in. And anyone with any questions, just, you know, stop and ask me. So I'm going to be covering a bit of like, especially what Dom covered um, last month with a bit of the task information and just withdrawing um, information from the task sheet. So you sat in the briefing in your kind of first competition, you get this task sheet in front of you and you've got to somehow get all the useful information off, off that piece of paper and and onto your kind of laptop or your iPad or anything like that. So, you know, starting from the top, the the most useful one there is the launch area. So you would punch that in, drop a waypoint, and see where you're taking off from. And then I kind of work down it. PDG, um, there's no specific kind of information there that I can put straight into my laptop initially. Um, so I'll skip on to task two, which is the JDG. I've got the coordinates. I'll stick that into my laptop as well. Um, and there's not nothing else. There's only one target for that. So I'll just um, go on to the maximum distance. And so this is like a slightly more complicated one. If you remember how Dom talked about maximum distances last month in um, his presentation, this is an even more like step up when the directors uploaded a GPX file, which is just a specific boundary um, that you that they've probably uploaded to watch me fly or sent you via email that you can just download and upload it straight into your um, mapping software. Um, correct, Richard. We'll be getting to that. Um, and then finally on to the fly on it's a pilot declared kind of fly on again so um you've got to declare that before the nine five um zero 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 easting which means that's where i use the target the scoring areas to draw that on the map to give you that like clue to remember to do that so this is like a screenshot of post flight just a very you know overall thing you can see 
all the kind of targets i kind of color coordinate them which is really useful if the director specifies which color marker you've got to drop in which task um i will you know put the waypoint of that specific color and then so all the fluorescent pink ones are my pdgs there's one orange jdg there and then the green is my fly-ons um so if we go on to just the takeoff and task one from the task sheet the information that we got off the task sheet for the task one was the um it had to be one kilometer minimum away from launch and then no maximum so you're already looking at this and you can see the bit of information before you have to put it into logger marker one or two so you're allowed to put two goals you're allowed to declare two different goals for this task so but you have to do this before takeoff as well so i'm thinking straight away that i'm putting one you know close into the launch and then one a little bit further away in more in line with the targets if that's what i want luckily there was no altitude restriction to this this specific task so you can put it 500 feet above ground in the wind that you see the other the balloon in front of you kind of taking off and going in in a straight line at a, exactly one kilometer from you and that's where like the task ring that you can see around the blue launch is very faint there but again that's a feature with aussie you can change the thickness of that so i'm guessing some of the um other pilots with maybe a little bit worse eyesight uh increasing the thickness of that i just might have a little bit fresh eyes and like to declutter my screen a little bit more so i use that so then when you're flying and i'm in the air here i can right click on uh, the pdg3 i think that is and press navigate 2 that will then populate all of these features that you see here on the right hand side um so it's like distance to the goal is 682 feet two meters sorry and then the heading that you want to go and it even says that i need to get turn left three degrees to continue going there and then it calculates at that current um at that current speed it's going to be a minute 47 until i reach that goal um and then so if i kind of declared that goal at a thousand feet i'm currently at 2000 feet i need to descend so then you can use all of that information that you're getting given on the screen straight in front of you to plan plan your approach into that specific target um so this is just kind of to cover everything that dan and top dom and everyone has talked about um you got to remember the, that you to you declared in the bls system that robo talked about is um you have to declare the coordinates as well as the altitude so it's all done by 3d scoring and Pete, 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 sorry to interrupt uh good evening uh, gentlemen and ladies uh, i have a question if you will get back to the previous uh slide or picture about uh, declaration have you put both of them the same time you mean uh, you have a permitted number for of two and you put both of them on the same time um so both of them have to be declared before you've taken off but in the task sheet that you see in the top right hand corner you can put you put one of them into logger goal one and logger and then the second one into logger goal two you will be automatically scored to the one that is closest to um, logger marker one, which is at the very top of the task sheet. Oh, my, yeah, my apology. I just missed it before takeoff. Yep, yep. Thank you. Okay, okay. So yeah, 3D kind of scoring. Dom won this task here, 19 meters. Um, you know, so if he was 10 meters away horizontally from it, he was then about 30 feet high or low. That gives you the nine, the extra nine meters. So he's, you know, 19 meters away from 
the goal in a triangle if you kind of can imagine that in your head um very reasonable i think the whole thing about the competitions is that you're using and we're going to see in the next result this the, in the next task um specifically how 90 meters can be amazing in one and then the next task it could be it could be right down low or it could be a dream score for any pilot which we're going to see <clears throat> no? it's all relative um task two jdg the bread and butter of competition flying trying to fly towards a target sadly none of us made it on this flight in the um, in nationals last year but it brings up a very useful feature in aussie so as i was flying towards the, the pdg you do the same on the JDG, you right click, navigate to, and it will and it will um give you your best um track to get there, which we were all unable to get the you know the right wind to navigate towards that target. So we're all looking for the absolute best result that we can get. And that's when you use this um transit feature in the bottom the second, you know one up from the bottom of Aussie target and what that does is uses your track that you're currently flying and draws and drops a waypoint at the best possible result that you will ever receive if you continue flying in a straight line so you do if you your track changes a little bit you're going to update the transit and it'll just drop a new waypoint but then when you overfly that waypoint, you'll get a notification that just says, oh, you've overflown it, you've flown in the wrong direction. So um, that basically triggers you to go, oh, and drop the logger on your phone or drop the, the marker on your phone because no one could drop a physical marker in that task. Um, yeah, so moving on to the results for that, as I said, 19 meters won the last one, whereas 1600 meters, you know, 1 1.6 kilometers won this task. So, as Dan said, it's all completely relative mm. to the, the other people in your in that specific task. Well, I was on target. <laughs> you had a fun morning then watching the yeah. horizon. Very small balloon to the far. <laughs> Great fun. Um so the XDI. As I mentioned earlier, you got a little GPX track which can either be uploaded to Watch Me Fly or emailed out to all the competitors, and then you can just upload it. Uh, very simple. You could also do that in memory map. Uh you could even do that in hot air actually. Um, and the other apps so you know nothing has been too limiting to only Aussie throughout this task sheet especially and well really in any of the task sheets that you'll ever fly it just aids you a little bit more to you know get that slightly better result um, so during the briefing I forgot to mention earlier I use kind of the features in Aussie to measure between the um, measure between the reference point of the maximum distance to find the best result in the task, which I dropped a marker on that's the far right side, XDI. So if anyone didn't fully understand the task, you are being scored the furthest, the largest distance wins, the greatest distance wins between your logger marker within this red um, boundary and the launch coordinates. Um, I worked out, you know, in the briefing that the best score is about just over 17.7 kilometers. And that's right in the tip of that mark up there. Again, because of the wind in this, we weren't, I, well, especially me, I wasn't quite able to get the best result. So I'm taking the result and dropping my logger marker definitely within side the GPX kind of file to ensure that I score a par score on this task. Um, if you don't 
forget or if you forget to drop a logger marker you forget you drop it a minute or you know a meter too late the other side of the boundary i'm afraid you're probably going to get a no result with that and then you also get a no result if you don't fly through the space so you're unable to drop the um to drop the the um logger inside so the result for that as i said 17.7k was the best um the best score um you see that rupert got like 16.8 which is a very good one and then sadly there's two no results at the bottom which i'm guessing are one of the two things that i just talked about you either didn't fly through the uh the few through the gpx or you press your logger outside it so you were unable to score which is a bit bit of a shame have we got a Sorry. yeah just letting you know <clears throat> for this one pete it was on track point so you were just scored to whatever yeah it was the best track point you got within that shape so i think the two no results were two people that that were missed it to the south correct oh they change it then because at the top of the task sheet it does say logger marker but it says they... scoring position before the first out track point yes okay i, I use Aussie to zoom in on the track finding the last track point understood yeah. yeah so that that does um you know help with pilots and finger troubles because it's you know we there's always the case that if you do press it and then there's a slight delay in the software um that you might press it a meter before the line and then it drops it five meters after um i'm sure Robbie's software doesn't do that on purpose or very often but there's always that possibility so some directors like to do that um but yeah that was a debating com topic in the I can't, I can't i can't use technology technology to fix user error or shaky fingers <laughs> yeah why not same, but we always like trying to come up with it's someone else's fault don't we um it's always your fault <laughs> Um, so yeah, that's the results. And any other questions on that specific task? Um, last task here. Um, as uh, we mentioned earlier, the nine five um, line is drawn on in red, and whilst you're flying, you have to declare the fly on goals again you can declare two of them in logger goal three and logger goal four any time before that um that um northing there um so as i'm flying there i've probably completed and declared both of them and then concentrating on the xdi so this is where you've got to think about the tasks in kind of a different order and just i personally kind of especially do it whilst I'm driving to the launch site or in briefing, kind of plan the flight in in front in your mind and maybe even write some notes of the order that you're going to fly it and, um, and the order that you're going to have to do stuff within your basket. So another question, just comments. Um, so yeah, in the briefing, just to save a bit of time in the air, I'm dropping a load of potential um, fly-on goals there at um, just some junctions that I think I'd like to visually see where I'm going. But I think Dom mentioned this last time that you don't need to do that. You can put it in the middle of nowhere because it's all done by GPS nowadays and it's recorded to a 3D point in the sky. But the difference, the main difference between the, this fly on and the PDG at the bit bottom was this declaration altitude and goal shall have a minimum 500 feet difference. Um, so in this task, you know, we're flying at about four. I think we might have even been up at like 6,000 feet getting this um, left up towards the maximum scoring, you know, point of the uh, maximum distance. So. I could, I can't just stick at that 4,000 feet, draw a straight line and drop it there because that's 
not more than 500 feet difference, you're either going to get penalty points or you're going to get a no result if you end up doing that. So I chose, and I think a lot of pilots would choose to use the lower level winds where it's a bit more um, reliable steerage um, closer to the surface to then navigate yourself into a target. So I'm, I think I chose, you know, down at a thousand feet or so. So that's definitely 500 feet away from the 4,000 feet that I'm currently at when I'm punching the, these numbers into my phone. Um, and then I'm definitely before that nine five as I'm going towards it. And again, you have two, you can declare two of them. So, um, you can, you can declare one before you've taken off just as like a last resort in case you, um, in case you don't have the time before you reach that area that you can't do it on my computer's frozen. Okay. Fixed. Um, results of that quite similar to the first PDG. You know, you're looking if in a 3D kind of PDG fly on, if you're in single digits or even teens, you're doing very well at pretty much any event. It's all kind of relative. Um, and again, if we look at the bottom of that, Lindsay there with a 34,000 metre um, result, I'm guessing um, that that would probably have been an error where she probably punched in, you know, one of her coordinates into the thing slightly wrong. And sadly, she's going to get scored to the exact coordinate that she punched into the device. And therefore, she's going to get a, a result which doesn't actually, um, you know, relate to her fly abilities, but to her finger pressing and... That sadly is how it works and how the competitions is nowadays. Um, so again, there, that's just showing everything off. Did anyone have any questions about that specific like, flight or the Aussie functions that, we, that are on the screen now or anything that we've brought up so far? I just, I saw this. A lot of questions about what laptops people are using and stuff to run Aussie. I thought I'd just make a quick note that the Aussie Explorer technology really hasn't changed much since the late 90s. Um, so it actually doesn't need a very powerful computer to run. Uh, the things that you need to consider are um, battery life and um, just making sure that, yeah, you've got a, a tablet or a laptop that's going to last you a three-hour flight and not going to suddenly run out of battery mid-flight. So, yeah, a lot of people use Surface uh, Microsoft Surface Pros. They have good, good battery life. You can take the keyboard off and just sort of mount it on the side of the basket really easily. But even just a, a cheap laptop these days, you can actually run it quite effectively. You don't need to go and get the most high-powered machine. Yeah, exactly. And as you said, some people like using the thing, using just the the screen of the surface pro and then punching it in with their fingers whereas a lot of other people like to have a mouse and then there's even competitors in the uk that have a complete desk and a a physical mouse you know a wireless mouse to the side that they <laughs> drag and press other buttons um but it's completely up to the pilot that can choose their setup yeah, Pete, uh, I have a question. Can we back here? Yeah, the, the wind reader on OZ Explorer. Um, you, can you use it the same way like you use it in hot air when you, let's say, climbing up at particular altitude, for instance, 4,000 feet, and it will show you the direction and speed at particular uh, marks. You, instance, you have 50 feet difference between altitudes. Uh, does it work the same way or you can use only the, you know, the uh, gun reader, uh, wind gun reader um, so, information on. on... Um, I think you're getting the two two different um, bits of the software muddled up there. They're two separate things. Is the flight winds, which is exactly the same as 
in hot air versus the wind reader data, which is the larger one in the center of the screen. Um, mm -hmm. where that's where you input put the data from your wind gun. Uh, yep, yep, yep. I'm good. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. It's all right. Um, okay. We'll just continue on a little bit more. Pretty much done now. Sorry, it's overrunning so much. Um, so the competition specifics here that when you are flying in a competition nowadays, they'll they'll give you a, provide you a map. The organisers will provide you a map in the UK. We try and do it both memory map or Aussie, so that um, you can boot it up and it all works the same for all the competitors. Uh, that's the same with the PZ files that are kind of uploaded to watch me fly and then all the competitors will download them from there. So then you're seeing the exact same information that all the scorers and the officials are seeing. And goal lists um, are used a little bit, not really used in the UK too much, but that will just be like a, a list and each goal might have a number it will give you the coordinate and maybe the elevation and a little bit of useful information about that um but it's not overly important but it's just yeah when you're doing a competition normally you get all this information provided to you quite nicely there we go um I'm going to start off with uh, if anyone's got any questions you guys can ask, but I'll ask you a question first. If you guys use any other software for flying, does anyone else use anything else? And is there any functions or useful things in those software that you use uh, that I might not have talked about or that is available in any other software? <laughs> Yeah, I have a question, uh, actually, an answer and question. I'm using for the you know commercial flights an Aussie target and uh, GPS, and I found that GPS is quite accurate. When you fly in competitions, guys, are you using only uh, software or you're using uh, GPS at the same time? Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, well, I'm using the GPS, which then outputs the data onto my laptop screen. So I'm effectively seeing the exact information from the GPS, but just on my laptop screen. That's provided to you via Aussie. Does that in, you know. No, 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 no I'm, I'm using Garmin and Aussie with the attached GPS, uh, which quite accurate, but I found that Garmin is better and quicker. Uh, that's the point. Are you happy with the, for instance, you fly in Aussie and uh, yeah. the GPS not very accurate if compared well, with a uh, better well, device? Are you yeah. saying you're using the GPS of the laptop because that is I'm not using, be so accurate? Uh, yeah, I'm using and uh, laptop and GPS because GPS is more accurate. Yeah, if you connect the laptop to the GPS and then you're getting the data from the GPS, that's where you get the most accuracy. And that was kind of going back to what we we're talking about with the balloon life sensor. If you connect the laptop to the balloon life sensor and be feeding the GPS data from the sensor, then you've got the data that's as accurate as what the balloon live app's using, which is kind of what you want. But if you're relying on the GPS within the laptop, it's a bit like your phone's GPS. They're not very, very accurate because they're a very small sensor. Mm. Actually, yeah, good point. Uh, I have a uh, life sensor, but still uh, not used to use it. Yeah. Thank, yeah. thank you. Anyone else got any questions? Sorry. So did... You obviously use Photoshop as well to make sure you look like you're closer to the target. No, no actually, he just gets a good photographer. <laughs> it looks like Brad contacted me. <laughs> no, you can see the, you can see the, the shade. Bit of space between the ground. Yeah. Um, it's not a question, but just a comment on. Um, it's obviously quite a lot of information there on both the balloon live sensor and the different navigation software. My, my best advice is is just to really practice it, and you can practice a lot of it like 
Robbo and uh, Pete said, just at home, especially with the app, uh, and then with whatever uh, competition software you're going to do and just try and get get a few task sheets, just load them up and to put practice putting some waypoints in, practice declaring your own goals and, and practice dropping markers on the app. It might seem a bit silly just doing it at home, but it will help just familiarise yourself with it a little bit so that when you're coming into a, a task briefing for the first time, you can use more of your mental energy on focusing on actually what you're going to do for the flight rather than just remembering how to learn all these little bits of uh, technology. And then also like what Pete said for Aussie Explorer, there's there's so much, as for Aussie Target mainly, sorry, there's so much information there. I don't think anyone that started using Aussie Target used all of that on the first competition that they they like Pete said they just started started with one or two features and then slowly added the rest in so that's that's what I'd advise for that just do it in little manageable chunks it's also worth yeah. testing all your technology before you show up to the event the number of times people at master briefing turn on their gear for the first time and realize they have to do all their software updates and things like that it's a nightmare so most events will actually set up a practice task before the event starts so you can test everything out but it still amazes me how few people do that yeah yeah so we, had, we had a training competition and instead of flying they drove by car because the weather wasn't good enough for flying <laughs> so we made some tasks they could do in the car <laughs> one driving and one uh, using the logger yeah. it worked they learned yeah they probably got closer than we did on that flight to the declared goal, I'd have thought, in the car. Well, the donut was a bit difficult. The donut was round and the, the road was not. <laughs> I do know of a pilot that rides his bike and tests the, how fast you have to go and what the lag is of pushing a button to get a result in the middle of an intersection. I won't name his name. But, uh, his technology's <laughs> been talked about a lot today. <laughs> Does he hold the logger to one side of the basket? To gain that I extra. I oh, yeah, um, sorry, guys. I have a question. What sort of software are we using between crew and pilot? Uh, let's say that crew to chase uh, pilot in case you've lost the view or whatever. I personally, um, and I think a lot of the UK guys, we haven't progressed onto that um, subscription service from Aussie, but we're mostly using like a tablet for the crew have just memory on the tablet and then i normally go halfway into the flight and then share my live location on whatsapp with the crew and then no, uh, but do that That's the crew can follow the pilot on what we fly during the competition live exactly yeah. that's another useful function and you found it's the, the, the best one well it's live so you know where he is that's as long as your phone's got signal, the same as what's Yeah. Well, we have in the Netherlands. Yeah. It's funny how this 6,000 feet or whatever. That is the, but then this movie it. review is sponsored. On that, um, on that particular topic, I, I found that I like the feature in Hot Air, which uses Glimpse to share your position with somebody via email. Yeah. So, because I use a, uh, an iPhone, the uh, the crew have my position available to them at all times, which is also quite handy. Yeah, that's the better thing about Glimpse than WhatsApp Live Location is that it actually shares your current speed as well. So, well, when I'm yeah commercial flying, I do share Glimpse rather than WhatsApp because they can kind of see if you're stop in and then they can kind of gauge the speed if you're slowing right down you know you might be lower in looking to land so they'll they'll do their best to get a little bit closer to you uh, the good the thing that i will warn, not warn but highlight is it's probably this is a good reason why you want a second device that's running the balloon live app i wouldn't recommend necessarily running glimpse as well as the balloon live app on the same device because you're basically going to be overworking your uh, your phone. That's a lot of GPS stuff going on. And yeah, I wouldn't risk your results just to get your crew right. to you. I, I always run that from a from a second phone. <laughs> I yeah. should have said that. Yeah. Which is which is actually also a point I was going to mention about when you're using laptops for competitions. Um 
I was using some very old laptops, but they had great battery life and they were great in the sun and you could drop them from height because they were tough books. But I did go into one competition where I was using a, a balloon life sensor via Bluetooth and I had a Bluetooth dongle plugged into the side of the Jeep uh, side of the laptop so it would work. And I hadn't tested it before getting to the competition. And although the PC was powerful enough to run memory map and it was powerful enough to run the Bluetooth connection, it wasn't powerful enough to run both at the same time. And the first time I found that that was on the first competition flight, it would just freeze the map. <laughs> so <laughs> test it before you go. Yeah. Yeah, this is the good point. Test before you go. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great point, but no one ever follows it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, just on that, which might have confused a little few people that you don't need to have um signal on your phone to to fly uh if you go into a valley and you lose signal the balloon you know live software that andrew's built is going to just store it on your device and on the logger until you gain signal and then it will upload it straight away once you've got signal back and then if all else fails at the end of the flight and something's gone wrong you can take the logger into the scorers they'll plug it into the computer and just download all of the same information that should be uploaded via your phone just straight off the um, device itself. Anyone else? We just, I've just got um, some upcoming events just to try and hit the sales numbers of the comps club. Um, new beginnings, that's very soon. This isn't a GP or anything official. It's just ran by Steph, Bareford, and Hemmings. By, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, she's married now. Um, yeah, she so, should get a new email address. Yeah, probably. That's what confused me. I asked on that. Um, yeah, there's an entry form there. We'll share this slide deck with everyone else that joined on the call. And... That's a very useful one that we'll just go through a lot of what we've talked about in these last three um, three presentations and we'll do it in person and demo it with our computers out and, you know, it'll just be a lot chattier and any questions, explanations, anything like that. And hopefully get to put it into practice with some flying. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then yeah dan's just saying i think there's there's going to be a load of the competition pilots there and maybe not everyone every some of them will be happy to fly with any competitors or any new guys that just want to fly with a more experienced competition pilot or maybe even a competition pilot is flying with 21st century software just to get all that information exactly from you so if you want to sign up for that message the comps club and they'll they'll be keen to buddy up with you guys for the weekend john yes we have just bought a windsond and i believe we are going to be practicing with that at new beginnings um so we haven't i don't think we've tried it yet but it's in the hands of some people from the comps club and we will be using that for the first time at new beginnings so you better watch out, yeah. So then we got GP1, GP2, and then GP3 is TBC. Um, but that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks, will it, Dan? Yeah, potentially, yeah. Okay. Lovely. Some links. As I said, Aussie Target YouTube channel is great. And so is all the stuff on Watch Me Fly to learn about um, all of that individually. And if you want to get involved with that, you can watch that. We'll send all this stuff to you and you can enjoy. Sorry that's ran over a little bit, um, but hopefully that's a lot of information. And next time it will be flyable, so we're not going to do another one of these. <laughs> Dan? Do you want to say anything? Okay. If there's any more questions or anything like that, hit us up. I'll stay on here for a little bit longer. 
whilst well, I've got to go to work, so I better not. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, thank you very much, Robert, for joining the call today, tonight. Um, well, in the morning for you. And yeah, thank you to Don and the other speakers that have spoken throughout the three sessions. And hopefully people that have never done competition ballooning maybe be feeling inspired and want to take up uh, competition ballooning or come and give it a go. So obviously you will be uh, promoting through the comps website and also the comps Facebook page. But yeah, on to the next steps and hopefully flying soon in April. Thanks very much, Dan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Thanks, Pete. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.